Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Bobby Mukamala, Flint community leader, medical doctor, and the chair of the American Medical Association. We're going to be talking about Flint, the community, and the importance of cultural institutions, and in particular, the Flint Institute of Arts, to the community itself. And Bobby, thanks so much for joining us. I'd like to talk with you about this idea of a professional, a medical professional in this case yourself, and why you are interested in cultural institutions. Why is art so important to this community and to professionals like yourself? Yeah, it's an, I mean, it's an interesting question. I sort of look at uh, otolaryngology, which is my profession, um, as you know, my, my nine to five job, some people, their job is their calling. Uh, and, you know, given the amount of time spent in medical school and residency, I mean, certainly have invested a lot of time in it. But if the schedule is such that that allows you to have time to do something beyond your, your nine to five job, so to speak, I think there is enormous um, need and value in participating in the community uh, beyond your vocation, right beyond the occupation. Um, and you know, my parents moved to this country as immigrants from India um, with basically a job contract, and, and they started work here in Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now fast forward, I grew up here, went away for residency in, in medical school, and then came back 22 years ago. And, and my goal in coming back was to leave it better than, than I found it, right? Just like my parents' goal was to leave it better than they found it. Uh, and that happens by engaging in things like the Cultural Center, in things like the Flint Institute of Arts, just an opportunity to give back. Luckily, I have the means, my family has the means to be able to participate, be philanthropic um, and support this. And one thing that I noticed is that if you read the history of Flint, Michigan, you would never think that an organization like the Flint Institute of Arts or the Cultural Center would survive what Flint has been through. Right. right? Whether it's economic, whether it's public health, um, you just would never predict that a city like this would have this sort of collection of art um, in these buildings um, and, and music across the street and theater down the street. Uh, but it does because of philanthropy, right? because of the generations that came before mine um, that kept that alive. And I don't want to see that flame extinguished on my watch, so to speak. Could you talk a little bit about that identification of yourself as a member of the Flint community? Yeah, yep. It's a, you know, this is a, a town that started um, as part of the lumber industry and, and then, you know, started to make carriages and Carriage then wheels. started to make horseless carriages when they started to put motors in them instead of, you know, horsepower instead of horse driven. Um, and that was sort of the, the, the boom of Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that boom, we were lucky to um, have people, uh, you know, the early pioneers of the auto industry be so successful that they left a legacy in institutions like this, right? We as citizens of Flint are the torch bearer, just like the- And that history torch. becomes our history, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And then we become part of that fabric, that part of that. How, how do you see that uh, playing out today in the United States? Are we, are we losing that sense of cohesion where we're, um, welcomed and invited and inviting to others to become part of that. We used to call it the melting pot, but maybe it's not a melting pot. Maybe we're just deciding who our family is and making that true, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? it, uh, I mean, I think that there's always a risk of losing it depending on, on the culture. And certainly in this past two years of dealing with um, COVID in, in a pandemic environment, mm -hmm. That, um, that cohesiveness of a, of a society, of a community, is definitely at risk, right? When we can't gather to enjoy a show or to listen to a lecture um, for a year, then yes, that, that erodes those, those ties that sort of bind us together. But I don't think that, that, is, that it is that fragile. Um, luckily in our community, it's not that fragile, right? It's been here for generations. So doctor, is, one, is what you're saying that part of the healing uh, prescription uh, to counter COVID is to make two pots and call me in the morning, uh, <laughs> see, see an exhibition and, exactly. and, yeah. uh, no, and, and check back in? Absolutely. I mean, especially when you think about um, who has suffered the most, even post-vaccination, right? And now boosters, the people that do everything that they're supposed to do, but are still at significant health risk are our elderly, right? So the average age of the vaccinated person that ends up in the hospital is in their 70s. Um, and so they're the ones that 
that despite it being relatively safe for everybody else to come out and be and be boosted and have conversations like this, um, they're the ones that are still missing out on these opportunities. And so I'm very much looking forward to getting back to a sense of normalcy where my my 75 year old you know colleagues and, and friends in the community can uh, can come out and and enjoy this institution again. How does this organization function in in a way that that you feel it's worth your time, your irreplaceable time, to ensure that it continues that work uh, to make this place a healthier uh, healthier place. Yeah. I, I think it's critically important to keep a place like this healthy and vibrant and growing, right? I mean, it, it, there's a tendency, I think, and for evolving, institutions. Right? Exactly, yep. And I think there's a tendency for institutions like this to be too static um, and and just keep exhibiting and rotating through the stuff that's that's there um, in a, in a closet somewhere and, and bring that out and just go through the cycle of the calendar and do that, uh, but that's not at all what the environment is here. What are the things that you can't get in other places that you can get in Flint? I mean, I, I would say that the ability to have impact um, sooner is dramatically more here than anywhere else. And to test new ideas at a lower cost, right? Absolutely, yep. So so by day I, I clean out earwax and I clean people's noses, uh, but now I find myself an owner of five restaurants and a clothing brand um, as part of the downtown Flint revitalization. Mm -hmm. That is something that I would never be able to do had I stayed in Chicago where I did my residency, right? It would have been cost prohibitive. But here, when we have a downtown that's sort of ripe for redevelopment, when the cost of, of opening up a restaurant is low because occupancy cost is low, um, that's an experiment that can be done. You can play a little bit. Absolutely. It's not as if every day, if that day lapses and you haven't made your receipts, you're right. done. Yeah, exactly. And and, and I, have, I have the luxury of having my day job not depend on the success of these investments. Mm -hmm. um, and so I see it as, an, as a way to, again, you know, build something where the difficulty of doing that in a big city would be prohibitive. Here, we have an ability to revitalize downtown. Um, and because it's not such a big footprint, five restaurants on the main drag in downtown Flint is a dramatic change as opposed to five restaurants in a huge city, like even Detroit, you know, right. you know, an hour down the road. Um, because of the geography is being, it's so big, it's a drop in the ocean. Here, it's a, it creates a significant wave in a small pond. If you're joining an organization like the Flint Institute of Art at, as its leader, mm -hmm. um, you also have a very substantial uh, civic community uh, that and a business community that is going to welcome new skills into the community, new sensibilities in the community. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's. And I think it, it's again, it's a factor of the size of town that we are, mm -hmm. right? And so when we see a new face. I, there, I imagine in a bigger city, there's a tendency to to have that again, just be another guppy in that ocean, mm -hmm. um, and and not pay them any mind because you, those people tend to come and go. Here, there's a real embracing of that new face, just because one, it's an opportunity for us to sort of learn about how do how you know what what is the scene where you were from, mm -hmm. right? What, what's the art scene? What's the music scene? Um, in a way to sort of try to grow ours uh, based on that outside influence, right? So there's a real interest in having those conversations with those new faces. And frankly, it just makes life more interesting, right? It, it adds variety. Now you're on the board of the CS Mott Foundation. So you're, you're also engaged in decisions on investments. Mm -hmm. And uh, a dollar cannot be spent twice, right? A dollar, once you're invested, you're invested. Mm -hmm. How do you and your fellow foundation trustees decide on balancing the investments so that you get the biggest bang for the buck in each of the areas that you invest in. Could you describe the impact that you're trying to create mm -hmm. and how you uh, determine what the balance is going to be as you debate your priorities in this yeah. community? Yeah. I, I guess what, what I'll start by saying is that this is my second month on the foundation board and so I've had one meeting um, with the board as a whole, and it's virtual. And so I'm very much sort of on the very steepest part of the learning curve as far as the culture. But See, of course, but that's, but, but that's the exact place to, because you're grappling with this issue right now. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and you know, it's, and having been 
on the observing side, you know, bef before being inside of the foundation and sort of watching the work that's done, um, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic to see the responsibility that this foundation has for these assets and making sure that what we do is sustainable, right? It's, it's, it would be easy to write checks in a very unsustainable way um, and not leave tomorrow better than today. It makes today better, but then tomorrow's the same. And that's not at all what I see um, in foundations like the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. And then, you know, the Ruth Mott Foundation is also in town and, and, and supports um, arts as well. Uh, and so it's a very disciplined way of making sure that the impact is sustainable, that it follows the mission. That, and again, so much of the focus of the foundation, which is a, an international foundation, but, you know, a quarter of the work is really focused here in Flint. And because of that focus, organizations like the Flint Institute of Arts and the other ones in the Cultural Center are still here with us today. As a new board member, how do you think about accountability? Because not everything is measurable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you start making everything measurable, then you might stifle innovation. But if you make nothing measurable, if you don't make enough measurable, mm -hmm. then, you know, the money can just be thrown out to the wind and dissipate. Yeah. yeah. I think my philosophy is that those people that are that are seeking the funding um, will have a sense of what they want to accomplish, right? Sometimes it's qualitative and sometimes it's quantitative. If it can be quantified and they can say, yes, you know, we did this and we've had a 50% increase in people that have come through or memberships have gone up or attendance has gone up, that's something that's very quantifiable. But if it's, for example, um, uh, a lecture series, right? Something to sort of increase awareness and, and, and a sense of social responsibility, whatever the purpose is, whether it's public health COVID related, whether it's it's gun violence and crime related. If we bring in people to raise the level of understanding on a particular topic, we don't need to show that gun violence decreased to say that that was worth it, right? We're, we're, we're planting seeds at that point. They may not all bear fruit, but you can, you can definitely predict that in some minds they will. And that, that's enough. Could you talk a little bit about what the community needs and the leader here that complements these other institutions that encircle the Flint Institute of Arts? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess what I would say is I want somebody that uh, that has a vision on how to grow um, and and develop what what's what's already here. I'm also excited about the possibility for what's not here today, and and that's what I want is somebody to not just sort of continue the status quo and maintain, uh, but to bring new ideas, um, and that's what I'm excited to see. So what you're talking about basically is inventing a future that today we don't know exists. Correct. Um, I think an institution like this will continue to evolve under the right leadership, and that's kind of what we're looking for. Arun Mukamala, it's been just a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for this wide-ranging review of, of Flint and how the Flint uh, Institute of Arts and the community engage with each other to create a very strong civil society. Uh, thanks so much for, for your insights. Thank you. My pleasure. I enjoyed the conversation.